Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. And welcome, above all, to our panelists, to our four panelists here up front. It's a wonderful event uh, to be together. And, with, you know, just so that we all feel the climate change, we're all here before the storm hit outside. So, um, first, I would really like to, to thank Lord Nicholas Stern for joining us today. He is, I think, for most of us, in a way, the, the kind of father of climate change economics and climate change policy. Um, the science, of course, was around, but many economists kind of ignored it. And it, with the Stern Report, the famous Stern Report, it really hit the profession. So to have Lord Stern here is, is really a great honor and a great a pleasure, and I'll say a few more words afterwards. A great honor and pleasure also to have Sri Mulyani Indrawati, the Managing Director and CEO of the World Bank. Um, as you know, she was Minister of Finance in Indonesia, a very successful Minister of Finance. But what I want to uh, stress is, in a way, it was you who brought the finance ministers of the world with the Bali Dialogue to kind of really focus on climate issues, on sustainability issues. Finance ministers had a way of leaving it to the environment ministers or maybe the development ministers, and it's really thanks to your leadership that uh, the things came together. And Robert Orr, my old friend and colleague, not old, young friend and colleague <laughs> from, the, uh, from the United Nations, who is Under Secretary General, advisor to the Secretary General on climate issues, but also Dean of the School of Public Policy of the University of Maryland. And then we have Amar Bhattacharya. I won't tell you how many years we know each other. He's always been uh, absolutely extraordinary in, in focusing on policy issues. He was uh, the director of the G24 Secretariat at the IMF and, and the World Bank. He's now a senior fellow with us here in Global and Development, but he is also internationally as active and as global and as networked as anybody would, would want to imagine. So, Amar, thank you. you. You did a lot in putting this event together and, of course, in, 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 the whole, uh, in the whole time that led to it. The topic is really how to implement Paris. Uh, uh, Nick Stern wrote a very good book about, came up out about six months, I think, before this, the Paris event. Things have moved on. Let me just maybe make three points, which one is a bookings point. Uh, we, we are celebrating our 100th anniversary and global and development our 10th anniversary. But we, the, the next strategy we're putting forward towards our stakeholders and our board of trustees is really that governance is the binding constraint on human progress at this point. And by, by governance, I don't mean government, although government is a big part of it. I mean governance in a multi-level and multi-channel way, and Paris was really quite an illustration of that. There were, there were governments, of course, but there were also cities, regions, private sector, NGOs, and I think more than technology itself and more than availability of finance, it is how to bring together these successful coalitions and how to then get them to work on implementation. I think that in many areas of, of, of policy that we face is, is really the binding constraint. U.S. corporations are sitting on $2 trillion of funds. Uh, I think it's something like, you know, more than they've ever had, something like 13% of GDP. And yet, uh, not enough investment is taking place. So the importance of governance, and that was illustrated by the Paris event. And then two, two more points, which I think are, are important, is finance may be around for some, but as Amar often stresses, and I think also you have stressed it, finance is not around in, in the way, in, in, in for all, and it, it is not there where it is needed most for the massive financing of sustainable infrastructure over the next decades. And uh, I think this is one of the key topics of, of the debate. We, we all talk about very low interest rate, close to zero, but you know, in, in developing countries, in emerging countries, when you try to 
borrow for long-term infrastructure, you face a very different financial kind of world. So how to bridge that? And bridging that gap actually helps uh, maybe overcome what Larry Summers has, has called uh, secular stagnation, because there seems to be a savings glut in the world. There seems to be not enough investment. There are all these needs, and somehow these savings won't translate into investment. And then the, the, the last point I want to make before leaving it uh, to the panel is, of course, investments have to be profitable. And one way or the other, I think carbon pricing is still crucial. Uh, if, if we don't have some form of price structure that makes these things that are, uh, that are so, have such high, both private and, and social returns, but uh, makes them profitable, given government policies and pricing policies, we'll have big trouble. So I hope that the issue of carbon pricing will be addressed by the panel. So with that, thank you again very much, and I leave it to Amar to conduct the discussion. Thank you very much, Kemal. Um, I was going to say, since four of us moved here, I was going to auction four seats in the front. <laughs> but unfortunately, they are already occupied, uh, with the exception of one. So, uh, so thank you all for coming. Um, I just want to put Paris a little bit. You know, everybody, I think, in this room probably knows Paris very well. But it's good to start with a frame. And then I want to turn it over to this great panel that we have. So, you know, Paris really was a game changer uh, in many regards. Uh, and I'll give my personal take. So the first thing about Paris, you know, uh, I think uh, in Indonesian we would call it a wine kulit. You know, it's a gun. The puppet show was started a long time before uh, Paris. And in particular, there are two features that made Paris very different. One is it was no longer about an us and a them, but about we. So it became really that countries came to this very much with what we are going to bring to the table, recognizing that others would come with their own commitment. And this was in the form of the you know, intended nationally defined contributions as a way to express commitments coming in even to the process. And the second feature of Paris that's very different is this principle of it's a framework that applies to everybody. There are 195 different countries, but the framework within which action will be done is shared and joined. So that's very important about Paris. Now, Paris, other thing that happened in Paris is these actions that were put on the table may not have added up to the ambitions, but at Paris, leaders reaffirmed, in fact, went beyond reaffirmation of a commitment to climate that way extends beyond what was on the table before. In particular, the 195 countries agree that we would move to net, carbon, net zero carbon in the second half of the century, and that on the mitigation side, the goal was to hold temperatures well below two degrees and preferably to one and a half degrees. There were also commitments, important commitments made on adaptation, on loss and damage, and yes, on finance. And I think what is particularly interesting about the finance piece was for a long time the finance piece had been really paralyzed in what are you going to give to us. And here there was a recognition that finance was about, the success of finance was as an enabler of bringing about an accelerated transition. So the dis discussion on finance was not about the billions or the hundreds of billions, but about how you move trillions of dollars that are needed 
to move towards a low carbon transition. There was also a focus on capacity building, on uh, technology transfer, very much on verification and transparency, uh, on a global stock take, recognition that this was every five year process and that every five years you would have to ramp up the tradition, I mean the ambitions. So I would say it was really a way of coming together. But what's also very important about uh, Paris is it's not just 195 countries that entered the discourse. It's a, it's a set now of country, uh, not only countries, but of businesses, of civil society, of public citizenry. And indeed, if it had not been for global citizenry, I don't think leaders would have come under the pressure that they came under in Paris. Uh, I have been working very much with, uh, actually with uh, Lord Nick Stern, on the aspects of, of, of finance, as, as supported very much by colleagues at the New Climate Economy. But I also want to stress that there are many other dimensions other than finance and sustainable infrastructure. There is very important action to be done on forestry, very important action to be done on adaptation. And the challenge of Paris right now is really translating the commitments into concrete actions. So what I hope that we will, in this panel, do is discuss what are the international and national actions that are now needed to really breathe concreteness into, uh, into the Paris agenda, and what is the role of different players. So with that, let me turn it over uh, to Lord Stern. Uh, you know, he uh, uh, is, as Kemal said, the most eminent thinker on this issue, but he's also the most important action player. So with that, Nick, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Amar and Kemal, for putting it all together, and for Bob and Tui Miliani, my friends, for joining this. Um, the, uh, I can't help thinking of Casablanca, you know, we'll always have Paris, <laughs> and uh, of course they didn't get anywhere after Paris, really. <laughs> um, so this, is, this has got to be different, so it's how you, how you ramp up after Paris. I want to speak about delivery, ramping up, urgency, but in the context of a global agenda. And we now, and it's remarkable, we now have a global agenda. In 2015, we had the Sustainable Development Goals, and we had um, uh, the Paris Agreement. So there is an internationally agreed sense of direction, and, and both of those are actually quite remarkable. I mean, compare Paris and, <coughs> compare Paris and Bretton Woods. Bretton Woods, 44 countries, one dominant country, and blood everywhere. In the last 30 years, two world wars and the Great Depression. It had to be obvious that collaboration to deal with problems, to integrate ourselves, had to be better than what we were doing before. That's, as it were, the human beings, or human beings together, looking back and learning from extreme experience. Now, 44 countries, one dominant, evidence clear. This is 195 countries. Mercifully, there is no longer one dominant uh, country. And we were anticipating, we were looking forward, thinking about the risks we were creating and the problems that we were bringing on future generations. From that perspective, it was remarkable. And it was partly the risks, which uh, increasingly people are understanding more deeply, but also, and this was fundamental, it was about um, seeing how to do it and seeing that this was a growth story the growth story in the shorter run as we build up the infrastructure, because that's the heart of this, and the growth story in the medium run as we launch innovation and discovery that can sustain in time, and the only growth story on offer in the longer run, because if we pursue well, a high carbon, or we make the high carbon attempt, we choke it off through the uh, very hostile environment that we've created. So that, th those two together, the growing understanding of the great risk, but together with the seeing what's possible. So the countries of the world agreed in Paris because they wanted to. And that sounds banal, but not because people forced them to, because they wanted to, and the reasons that they wanted to were good reasons and reasons that should stand. 
So it was a remarkable thing, but it's an understandable thing. And what we have to do is to build on that understanding to see how we go forward. But so how do we take that global agenda, particularly in the context of a world economy which is flagging and for some of the reasons that Kemal uh, set out? So the global agenda, Paris and uh, the SDGs, but in the context of a challenge which is in central, quite rightly so, to the G20 and others, of how do you rekindle growth? So this is the story of implementation. It's not just implementing the Paris Agreement in some narrow, narrow sense. <coughs> it's a still bigger story, even though the Paris story by itself is a big story. So that's the challenge and how we have to think. And sustainable infrastructure is at the heart of all of this. Now, there are other things at the heart of all this, but this is the biggest thing at the heart of all this. I mean, you can do the numbers in various ways, but something like 70% of emissions are associated with infrastructure and its use. Something like 70% of the infrastructure that's going to be built in the next 20 years, and it will be infrastructure that which will be the extra in the next 20 years will be one and a half to two times all the infrastructure that already exists. We can do it well, we can do it badly, and the consequences of doing it badly are intense, the consequences of doing it well are very attractive. So this is the story, this is those 2.7 multiplied by 2.7 together and you get roughly a half. That's why I say this is at the core of the story, but it's the biggest thing at the core of the story. So how do we make that happen? <coughs> and we have to emphasize the sense of urgency in all this. I've emphasized it already through the illustration of the infrastructure that's going to be built. But do it, think about the urbanization that's taking place. It will go from 50% of 7 billion, all oh, round numbers here, to around 70% of 9 plus billion by mid-century. Four parts, 3.5 billion to 6.5 billion. Now, the argument doesn't matter whether the increase is 2.5 billion, 3 billion, or 3.5 billion. You can see that this is a one-off story of urbanization because the demographics set is off and the, as the fraction in cities goes up, the increase of that fraction slows down. So this story of this next 20 years when we're going to invest one and a half or two times the infrastructure we already have, and this story of urbanization over the next three and a half decades, those cities will be shaped in the next 20 years. This is really urgent. If we get it wrong, we lock in high carbon infrastructure and we commit ourselves to cities where you can't move, you can't breathe, and you can't be productive. That sounds like a bad idea. <laughs> Especially if you put it in quite as an analytical way that I've just done. But the, the, the points that I've made numerically are actually very hard points. You can fiddle around on the margins, but they're real. And so this is the sense of urgency that we have to bring to the table. And that's a problem with climate because the effects are down the track, but actually the action is extremely urgent. So what do we do? Um, <clears throat> We have to think about the policies and we have to think about the finance. And I hope in the discussion we'll go into some detail. What are the policies? Well, we must stop doing mad things like uh, subsidizing uh, hydrocarbons in various uh, ways, uh, including, of course, all the pollution that they bring. Uh, and unpriced pollution is letting people do something very damaging for nothing. That's a subsidy in my book. It's a subsidy in the IMF's book, too, and they did a nice job on that. But those numbers are huge. If you, if you kill, through air pollution, a fraction K of your population each year, I'll give you the numbers from the UK, but let's get the algebra correct. If you kill a fraction K of your population, and a value of a life is M times GDP per capita, then the cost of that in terms of fraction of GDP is K times M. We kill in the UK 30,000 a year through air pollution, one over 2,000. The value of statistical life usually around 100 times GDP. 100 over 2,000, right? 5% of GDP. And that's in the UK. Now, some countries are worse than the UK in terms of air pollution. So the numbers there are very big. So stopping doing the stupid thing is big. 
So stopping subsidizing carbon, acting strongly on air pollution. Those numbers in terms of policy numbers are very big. And you've got to do it in a way that's clear and credible and long-lasting. So as well as the policies, the institutions matter too. Now there's a whole range of market failures that matter here. Obviously the, the greenhouse gases and the pollution, but so too um, the R&D, so too uh, the capital markets, so too the network structures, which are so important behind uh, all this, so too the information. You've got half a dozen market failures here that the policy story has to pick up and different kinds of policies. And all of those six that I mentioned matter. They're not small ones. I always put carbon pricing first, but this isn't a Chicago world where they've got one problem, just fix that, and the wonderful competitive entrepreneurial spirits of the world sort out everything else. It's not quite like that. There's another five implications right there. So we need, as it were, that kind of dynamic public economics, which looks at the way capital markets deliver, looks at R&D, looks at innovation, looks at learning. There's a real policy story. It's hard, but we can see how to do it. And it's got to be clear and credible. The other part of the story is the finance story. We've got to be, that, the kinds of infrastructure investments we're talking about are going to move from three, that Amar's the great numbers person on this, but we're going to move to around three trillion or so a year to five plus trillion a year. In that process I just described, the challenge is to release that, make it happen, and make it happen in a way that's sustainable. So partly it's the policies, but partly it's the finance. And what we've got to do is change cost of capital from six, seven, eight, nine, ten percent, the high cost of capital that, that uh, Kemal referred to, bring them down to two or three percent. And we can do that. And the multilateral development banks have a very powerful role to play. So does the uh, regul regulatory structures. But clear, strong, and stable policies bring down the cost of capital too. I was six years as chief economist of the CBRB. At some point, there were companies who could have, at that point, bought the entire EBRD. They had the capital to buy out everything we did. They wanted to come with the EBRD because of the extra security that it brought and the bringing down of the cost of capital. Multilateral development banks can draw people together. Um, it's not some investment bank, I mean, call it Goldman Sachs, for example, that rings you up and says, I've got a wonderful deal for you, Amar. You just relax, you just send the check, and I'll sort it all out. And, and that multilateral development bank brings people together in a constructive way. They can build up the skills. There's all sorts of reasons. Now, they can play and must play a much bigger role in this game if the cost of capital is to come down. Again, we can see how that can happen with moderate adjustments in the, um, in the gearing ratios, with uh, increased capital injections that can be actually quite modest and have a very big effect through the multiplier that we all know. So there's a story then of the problem itself, which is very big in getting the right kind of invest infrastructure investment going. It fits with the big story of the global agenda, and we can start to see the detail of the policies and finance. So that's what we have to get on with. Thank you, Nick. Uh, Bob, uh, you were one of those driving uh, the Paris Agreement from the inside, uh, and you know you have a, had a unique uh, role in catalyzing a lot of the, let's say, the positive energies <coughs> that were put together that Kamal mentioned. Uh, more recently, you also were the architect of a very important meeting here in Washington on the Climate Action Summit, which I think demonstrates this tremendous, uh, you know, broadening of stakeholder involvement. And the, you know, topics you took up are absolutely central to what Nick was mentioning. So, uh, you know, whether you want to talk about Paris or you want to talk about now the post-Paris agenda, floor's yours. Thank you very much, Amar and Kamal, for bringing us together here. I'm very glad to see that Paris can still command a standing room only room, uh, especially uh, here at Brookings. Um, I think the nice frame that Nick just laid out, that there, there were two very important differences about Paris that made things work. I mean, at so many points of this process, it wasn't working. And the first was the recognition of the price we're paying has been steadily going up. As I've had the pleasure <coughs> to travel the world with the Secretary General, unfortunately, one of the things that you get to see when you go to every corner of this planet 
is increasing impact. And everyone can measure that in their own local way. So I agree entirely with Nick that that was a push factor. But the pull factor, I would say, is even stronger on this agreement, which was the second point that, that Nick credited, the, the opportunity narrative, the fact that governments and other players recognized that there was opportunity in this. It wasn't just the necessity. So how do we uh, coax forth from an opportunity narrative to hard interest-based uh, investments across a whole range of, uh, of areas that need increased investment. Because I'm sitting up here with all this uh, finance and economic firepower, I'm going to focus on governance because uh, that's one where I think uh, at least I, I won't be quite as much in the shade of Mother 2 on either side of me here. Um, the governance piece of this equation is huge, and I would not underestimate how novel what happened in Paris was. Um, we have tried many times, and I, I would say in my time at the UN over the last decade, to coax forth a, a broader, uh, not just a multilateral model, but a multi-stakeholder model for governing uh, global <coughs> public goods. Uh, there are many reasons why we underprovide public goods and underprovide global public goods in particular. But this is a, a particularly vexing area, and as even one and a half years out from Paris, the common assumption was that climate would drag the SDGs down, that these two needed to be handled kind of separately because the development agenda was the positive agenda and the climate agenda was the negative agenda and could pull down the positive development on development. I think those, that assumption about what would pull what and what would pull what down uh, were inverted in the course of the, the year and a half or so leading up to both the SDGs and the MDG and the Climate Accord. So interestingly, how did we get to a, a, a sense of going from the rhetoric of mutually reinforcing goals in development, uh, global development, and climate change. I think the governance piece of this is central because uh, we broaden the base of the discussion fairly dramatically. Um, this was a negotiation among governments, but make no mistake about it, the governance were accompanied every step of the way of this process by not just companies, not just finance houses, but the citizens in the streets the NGOs, the academics pumping studies into the bloodstream in various countries and various decision-making processes. This is an ecosystem of governance that looks, tastes, and feels dramatically <coughs> different than it did two and three years ago. So it's a big deal that what happened in Paris is really the first, I would say, embodiment of a new governance dynamic. But it is fragile. It's powerful, but it's fragile. It's fragile because it, because it is intrinsically decentralized. There is no guiding hand that is going to push all of this, uh, whether individuals, institutions, or marketplaces. So it's a very decentralized equation. Uh, it is also uh, a, a uh, axiom that each one of those constituencies that I mentioned have different bottom lines. And how do you get the different bottom lines to at least add up or to uh, overlap enough on a Venn diagram that they will act uh, together? And so I think the governance equation is about holding all of these different constituencies, the multi-stakeholder uh, reality that we live today together, uh, to achieve three things that otherwise they would not achieve. First, as Nick mentioned and Mar mentioned, speed. Uh, time is of the essence. Everything we don't do today is something we have to do two or three times more of tomorrow, uh, or ten times more tomorrow. So speed. Scale. Um, getting uh, good solutions uh, into a lot more hands a lot faster. And the third, um, in addition to the S's uh, of speed and scale, I would say is strategic coherence. You can't 
just attack the climate equation piece by piece. So when Amar mentioned the Climate Action 2016 uh, summit that we held recently in Washington, D.C., getting multiple institutions to host a uh, single event on climate action is an interesting exercise. Not easy. But the power of bringing all those different institutions together uh, was, I think, demonstrated quite signally. The problem, however, is that at the end of each one of these meetings, everyone looks at each other and says, where's the next meeting and who's convening it? <laughs> and the answer is we have many platforms. We have many international platforms for uh, harmonizing our finance policies. And I think Sri Mulyani rightfully got credit for bringing finance ministers together in a new way. So there's a platform or platforms in the finance space that that's happening. There, there's a UN platform or multiple UN platforms. You have business platforms. You have all these different platforms. But what is the strategic uh, intent of these actors? There is a point at the end of each one of these successful multi-stakeholder summits or gatherings where everyone says, okay, not just where are we going to meet next, but who's going to call the play? <laughs> What are we going to do together? So if we agree to stay together and we agree to keep moving together, who is actually going to give us that, that direction? And I think here the governance equation is going to keep evolving fairly rapidly. Uh, this won't be owned by any single institution. I think the umbrella of the United Nations was absolutely central to the success of Paris, but the UN cannot by itself keep all of these actors in the field. The army is much broader than the reach of just the UN. Um, and I think here, there are a couple aspects to the governance equation that we need to pay particular attention to. Yes, we need to keep all these actors in the field, and yes, we need to prioritize and give some strategic direction so that they stay in the field. And Amar mentioned that the key areas in which we organize the summit here in Washington other meetings will organize it slightly differently, but we know what the wedges of the pie are that we have to address. We need to lower the transaction cost and make sure that the, the coalitions that are in the field around land use and the coalitions in the field around energy and the coalitions in the field around transportation or infrastructure stay in the field and that we make it easier for those coalitions to keep moving. We also need to leave some space open for new entrants to this coalitional approach. Um, not to shut the door and say, we figured it out. There's exactly eight pie wedges. Here's who runs each pie wedge, and off we go. We were very uh, excited by the entrance of lawyers, the global legal community coming in at Climate Action 2016. I will fess up that while I've been strategizing for years which constituencies we need to develop and where they are, I never thought of the lawyers. There is a lawyer at the elbow of every CEO making every decision, doing due diligence, talking about uh, risk equations. There is a lawyer at the elbow of every international institution. There is a lawyer at the elbow of every NGO, of every finance house. And we hadn't thought to bring <coughs> constituency into the heart of this discussion. So late entrant, but very important entrant. So now we had 80,000 lawyers represented at the meeting. They've now called the play for how to organize the global legal community to support this agreement. We need to keep thinking about which are the next constituencies that we need to weave into this tapestry of global governance. Another element of the governance equation that I would really underscore is the southern dimension. Um, it's not just years at the UN that has me viscerally conditioned to look at the composition of a room the minute I walk in. And in climate discussions, for years and years, you would walk into the room and it was a dominantly northern clientele, it was a dominantly northern finance base, it was a dominantly northern crowd. But that is changing, but it's not changing fast enough, especially in the governance side of the equation. You look at the boards of directors of all the different companies, the different national, international institutions, you still see a lot of the same faces. We do have to get very serious about being on a crash program of bringing Southern voices 
into the heart of the governance equation at all levels. Easier said than done, but we are making some progress. And lastly, I would point to an element of the governance equation which is very sensitive. And one always speaks about it in either code words or just very carefully. And that is about the institutional arrangements uh, of how to govern this regime. Member states negotiated this deal if you're a, if you're a UN uh, person. Governments negotiated this if you're coming from a national government. Um, but that is a framework. The governments created the framework to actually manage the, the moonshot, which is the rapid transition to this new economy we're talking about. Um, that's not the frame of reference we need to be using. And so on the institutional side, I think we have to work our way towards hybrid governance arrangements, which acknowledge that there are international governance arrangements in place, there are national governance arrangements, and there are corporate and private governance arrangements, and that part of what we have to do is actually harmonize and leverage the different strengths of those different governance arrangements. So I really welcome Kamal's focus. If Brookings is going to spend its next 100 years on governance, more power to you. Um, we need it. Um, lastly, I would simply um, recognize that I think the number of people in this room that I see that I know, um, I'm actually very heartened that I don't know a number of you in the room. This used to be a very small club of people talking about these issues. And you almost knew who was going to be in the room each time you went to go speak at an event like this. I'm very excited that I don't know a lot of you in the room and that there are new entrants to uh, this, uh, this issue. And I think we need to get a range of those new interests and new individuals and new institutions into the governance arrangements as fast as we can. Thank you, Bob. Uh, I think uh, the, that was a fascinating take on governance. Uh, because actually, it, in a way, Paris might be a way of a, a presage of a change in the way we approach global issues. So I think it actually is quite significant. But I also, uh, you know, I'm, you know, I'm struck that a lot of the failures of governance uh, in this. I mean, this is this is a case of rising to a high level of governance. But it's also, as you started by saying, where we for two decades we failed on the governance front. So Paris is a very interesting case of having gone from bad boy to good boy. But I also would say that in the case of Paris, it's also a case where the sinners became the best saints, mm -hmm. particularly the U.S., China mm -hmm. leading the way. Yeah. So it was also a very important kind of leadership change uh, in, in, the, in Paris that happened. Uh, Shumulyani, as Kamal said, you know, uh, you, may be, have, you, you know, you may be at the bank, but you, your, your engagement in climate uh, goes back a long time. Uh, you know, you also come from a country with the largest forest resources almost in the world, and where you also played a very, very, very important role when you were there on, on, on the policy side. Uh, uh, I want to, uh, uh, the, you know, as Nick pointed out, you know, the role of the multilateral development banks is key. Uh, the leaders of the multilateral development banks made really a very, you know, pivotal, con you know, commitment uh, in Paris. And when you look at the implementation of the actions that Nick talked about, the multilateral development banks are crucial. You personally have also stressed very much the impact of low-income countries uh, and the most uh, vulnerable countries and the need to focus on that. And you've recently written an excellent blog on it. Uh, so I just wanted to turn a little bit to two questions, you know, I mean, in this implementation agenda, what are the priorities, but also what do you think the multilateral development bank community can bring to the table? Thank you very much for inviting me for this wonderful good chat here on climate change. It's, uh, it's very, very encouraging to see that many people now are interested to not only attending, but I think actively playing a role in how to make this commitment to become uh, the real effective implementation. Within that kind of spirit, it's, that's exactly what the World Bank is uh, is now trying to do. I mean, right after or before the Paris or during the Paris meeting, and right after that, we launched what we call it the Climate Change Action Plan. I mean, the role of the multilateral development bank 
is very unique in terms of not only in financial sector, because we call it bank, that's why we have the financing power in this case, but we also have the knowledge as well as the convening factors. And our ability to always like participating or even in this case, adopting or implementing global public good agenda, for example, like climate change, in the context of the country is the, the strength of or the very unique role of our, our institution. So within this climate uh, action plan uh, that we are having, you mentioned, Kemal mentioned earlier, I mean, in the past, finance minister never talked about uh, the climate change, except if it has become a cost or in the, uh, so really mainstreaming the discussion of the climate change within the finance uh, ministries uh, is actually very, very important of what we call it an achievement of, of recognizing the need to take this issue up to the upstream level that is on the policy level. So the World Bank in designing the action plan is actually trying to develop and using the comparative advantage of our role in uniquely trying to combine between the global commitment. I don't have to repeat all the, the why that is and why this is important, why climate change is also important for the bank because without doing anything, doing nothing, meaning that by 2030 we are not going to achieve the poverty reduction, but instead it's going to have additional 100 million people uh, pushing down to the poverty level because of the climate change. It's also creating quite a lot of uh, many of the implications on the development side. So the why side is, is there. The how side is at least from the country point of view, 140 countries who are signing the INDC and becoming NDC is actually bank client. And many of them is now asking the World Bank group because we also actually working as a private sector uh, uh, side to really not only advising them, but really working on the institutional and policy and financing. So this is the unique role of us is actually we can work from the upstream policy institutional level up to the downstream in financing and then also leveraging or crowding in many of the uh, private sector or other sources. And then, then with that kind of operation, we are going to be able to capture the knowledge and using that knowledge to then uh, giving it to uh, other country or uh, client. So this is the area of the action plan that we are having. Different strategy of implementing it. It's the emphasizing on the implementation, the convergence between the global agenda into the country implementation plan, transformation in terms of ability to what Nick said is not business as usual, but you will screen each of your investment plan and policy in order for you to be able not only addressing the issue of development, but at the same time you are addressing the issue of adaptation or mitigation. It's to depend. So when you're talking about, for example, like energy, this is one of the most important pillars within our action plan is actually on the renewable energy. We are not only scaling up in terms of the building of the solar, but up to the grid level of how we are going to create the distribution that will enable this renewable energy now put within the grid. The solar is one of very big uh, story that we are having both in India, Bangladesh, but now we are uh, expanding a lot in, 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 in Africa. We are also talking, for example, on the most important challenge on the development at the end when Nick mentioned by 2050, we're talking about 9 billion people, mostly urbanized, they need more food, they need space to live. So designing the urban, but at the same time creating food security is going to be very, very important. And within our action plan, we really like working by choosing 30 cities, doing the action plan on how the policy can be designed in in actually making the city workable, become source of productive, but at the same time, it's going to be less carbon intensive. When we talk about land and water, this is going to be like one big issue. We are discussing about the forestry, 
50 countries going to be in within our action plan until 2020. And then we are discussing with which pilot that we can work more in real action that then can be used for other locations. So in a way, I think for the bank, the issue of implementation even has been discussed before even the final meeting of the Paris, when everybody having a lot of fun and meeting <laughs> in Paris, although I think I know that everybody was quite tense at that time because I think the situation in Paris after the attack was not really, uh, but that may be also another that create a momentum. At that time, the bank, even months before that, we've already discussed internally within the bank how we see this INDC, which we see growing from many of our uh, client countries. We look at it and then we think about how we are going to support the country ownership. As you are all, maybe many of you familiar with the development world, one of the most ingredients which is very important for any successful development policy or action is actually ownership of the country. You cannot, as an international institution, even with money, sometimes you can a little bit creating an attraction, but the most powerful in actually making sure that the result can be implemented, uh, can be really like uh, delivered, is when the country has the ownership. And with this climate change uh, meeting in Paris in which more than 170 countries have this the INDC, 140 countries are our client, we see that at least the country is already announcing it, that they have this commitment. We know that if even if you implement that, it's not going to be adequate to achieve this 2% uh, to, to degree in this case. But still within that context, we see that there is really a growing ownership from the country to try to show their contribution to reduce the emission. And then we look at all this action plan or their, their commitment, then we'll see how we are going to strengthen their commitment to become a credible action. So that is the area, it's really depend. Now the World Bank is also developing the action plan for each region. As you know that the way we operate globally, we divided the global operation into six different regions. Sub-Saharan Africa is the first who actually have a very detailed action plan from the smart agriculture activity, which is very critical for Sub-Saharan Africa, investment in infrastructure from renewable energy up to the transportation, up to even industry on a truck industry and how to make them more efficient, less emission. And then also in designing the city, that is all the area that we are discussing. And now this action plan for other regions like South Asia, East Asia, each of region have their own action plan, which I think the emphasis is going to be different. Sub-Sahara is going to be different from the East Asia because maybe in East Asia, it's more on an energy urbanization, transport is going to be big. But we also put, for example, policy as a very critical institution and policy. You mentioned about governance in this case. The issue of the fuel subsidy is huge. For many of our country, I mean, even now with the oil price, which is very low, it is actually a very good opportunity for many countries to address the issue of policy. This, we use our instrument, for example, our budget support in order for us to be able to strengthen, or in this case, to change, reform their policy in order for them to be able to be consistent with their commitment to contribute on this uh, NDC. So we then discuss, for example, in Indonesia, one thing, we talk about Egypt, another thing, in which they are talking about the subsidy reform. Country like Pakistan, India may be advantaged because they are major oil importer. At this very moment, it's very important for them to change and reform their, their fuel subsidy. That's one thing. The second policy, which is very, very important, which is our uh, on action plan, is the carbon price. Even before the Paris, the World Bank is already convening more than 90 companies plus local government and state, head of state, to then implementing it. I think we announced that by 2020, we want to double from 15% to 20% of all this carbon emission to be committed 
in adopting the carbon price and by 2030 uh, uh, we are going to even uh, increase and double it further. So that's on the policy level which is very important. It may not be like link it but it, it, it actually have very significant impact in terms of not only using the resource for the right for the right infrastructure investment but also in also addressing the issue of the climate change. I think the last thing that you mentioned about uh, the forestry, this is the area that the World Bank is also working. There is uh, 50 countries. We are going to use very specific 15 locations in which we are going to do the action plan with supporting the RAP Plus in order for them to be able to implement. I think from my own experience, all those lists of action is something which is easier to to put it in action plan like the one that you can just click in the bank that the hardest part is actually on the real implementation because really shifting the resource sometimes you have to deal not only with the policy but institution but also the political economy side let's say if you're talking about the forestry or you're talking about the fuel subsidy the fuel subsidy is not at the lower oil price is easier for you to do but you have to make sure that you are also creating a safety net so that when the oil price increase, the, the government is not going to be tempted to go back to this, what we call it, fixed price that then creating a distortion, especially for, for the uh, renewable energy. Forestry is the same thing. This has something to do with the opportunity cost of preserving the forest but at the same time, we want to have the economic benefit. There is an institutional aspect in terms of governance, uh, law enforcement, which is something is beyond the forest management itself, but still within the country own. So how the World Bank can actually provide something which is actually win-win and at the same time shifting the fundamental incentive so that the inst institution is going to be consistent with the commitment of this uh, climate change. So that is the area that we are all uh, uh, trying to do. Of course, the World Bank is using as a group, attracting more private sector. IFC is increasing not only investment using our own resources, but in mobilizing many of the private sector in order for us to be able to participate in the investment, especially on the infrastructure. So I'm glad that uh, this is going to be like the real challenging is on the implementation side. So the next COP meeting, we will be able to come up with what, what is can be done and what, what is actually need to be support further. Thank, thank you very, very much. So, I mean, my takeaways from this discussion is first that, you know, there is now a global agenda as Nick pointed out, but also as Bob said, at the end of the day now, we don't see climate development and growth in conflict. And that's a very important change that has taken place. So the directions are very clear. Uh, I thought, Simuliani, you talked at great length, uh, you know, in a very precise way about impl the importance of implementation at the country level. Uh, and, you know, I think the framework that you laid out is very persuasive. Uh, so I want to press a little bit on the question about what Bob said, which is, does that give us sufficient speed and scale uh, and actually outcome? And to be a little bit contentious about it, I'll give you a calculation that a colleague of Nick's has uh, done academically, but a very important one, which is if you look at the existing stock of infrastructure and look at how much carbon it would you know, put out there, it pretty much eats up all the carbon budget that is there. And now we are talking, as Nick said, of a 150% increase in infrastructure. And to be fair, most of that is in the developing world, which doesn't have the infrastructure. Okay? So it would not be fair to say you can't have the infrastructure because you would use up the carbon budget. So in this issue of scale, you know, and of speed and urgency, how does one manage that trade-off. And then the second -ish question I have in that regard is really the challenge of finance. So, you know, yes, there is plenty full of finance, but the reality is that finance still costs too much in many emerging markets and developing countries, even in a country like Brazil, 
the costs of finance for infrastructure is 10, 15, 20 percent, and you just can't finance infrastructure at that kind of cost. So how does one bring down, as Nick was saying, the cost of capital? And what role, you know, can we play? I mean, in a way, the MDBs are doing that, but how can one do that in a higher scale, you know, using very much, I think, the approaches that were mentioned? Uh, plus, of course, you can react to anything else anybody else said. So I just want to go for a second round, and then we will open it up to the floor. Nick? Um, th thanks very much to, <coughs> to, to Bob and Sue Mulliani, from whom, as always, I, I learned a lot. Um, on governance, um, I think that one thing we learned from Paris is that the quantities, the nationally uh, determined contributions, the quantities uh, are not legally binding, but the process of um, commitment, coming together, revisiting, measurement, and so on, is legally binding. And in this, it's peer pressure, seriousness of commitment. There is no police force from Mars or judiciary from Jupiter that's going to enforce this. And that's why it's so important to have something that people really want to do, and then they feel obligated to do it because they've said they would. And I think that process, the legally binding process, is actually quite strong, and I would bet that it would stand. So what about the governance of the, um, the emissions themselves, the nationally determined contribution? Again, if you look back to Cancun, where we had the promises for 2020, um, on the whole, <coughs> I mean, there's some exceptions, of course, but on the whole, the big blocks, China, Europe, US, are going to come in in 2020, not far away, perhaps even better than they said they would in Cancun. So the voluntary story on the numbers seems to come with greater ambition because you don't sort of err on the side of caution because somebody's going to give you a hard time in some formal punishment sense. So I think going legally binding on process but voluntary on the numbers was actually quite an important part of the story. A second aspect I'd emphasize is there were quite a lot of impl implicit promises and some explicit promises. The explicit promises were around R&D and some implicit promises within that about sharing. Quite a lot of implicit promises, some explicit, but quite a lot of implicit promises about how the finance was going to come. So I think delivery on those R&D-like promises, if explicit or implicit, delivery on the finance is going to be very important. So this is not governance by enforcement. Remember the word governance, at least in, I think in the Oxford English Dictionary, well, good enough for me, um, <coughs> is the manner of governing. It's the manner of governing, how it takes place, and how we behave within how it takes place. And the kind of institutions that we're involved with have a big part to play in that process <coughs> in goodwill, delivery on explicit as well as uh, implicit. The second thing I wanted to say is the uh, actors. Cities and mayors, given what we've already been saying about urbanisation, cities and the governance of cities is going to be very important. And how cities learn from each other, how cities share out ideas, how sh cities do uh, common procurement, which, you know, set standards for their buses or whatever it might be. They have great ability to shape what uh, will happen. Um, does it work somewhere? Well, go and find a city that has tried it out. That's very powerful. The power of the example will operate more quickly and effectively at the city level than at the country level. Because countries can always find, well, that doesn't quite fit, you know, we're different from that, but cities see more commonality. So the power of the example, I think, can uh, be uh, much stronger. So uh, the international development groupings, uh, financial institutions, I think, uh, focusing still more on cities would be a very big part of the story. Business uh, is enormously important. Increasingly, we're doing, businesses are doing well by doing good. And uh, I know that so, how many of you are old enough to know Tom Lehrer? There are only a few, but you know, <laughs> it was the boat peddler who did well by doing good in uh, Tom Lehrer. But the, the more and more, the businesses are doing well by doing good. 
because it matters to their customers where something is sourced. It matters to their employees. Mercifully, a lot of our students don't want to go to work for bad people, and they see bad people as people who despoil the planet and the environment. Shareholders don't want to go there. So increasingly, businesses are doing the right thing because it's the right thing, and we should respect that, but also because it makes sense. And there again, I think, um, uh, we're seeing much more the power of the example. The, the last thing I want to mention is, is finance, because that is at the heart of the whole thing. And that's why um, Amar and I and others are trying to spend as much time as possible with finance ministers, so we hang around with Sri Mulyani, who knows how finance ministers uh, behave. Some of us have worked for finance ministers and have some feeling also. But they set the policy. They set the policy. They complain if you're asking for too much. You've got to show that it makes sense, show that it makes sense fiscally, show that it makes sense from the point of view of risk, show that how a political economy can be overcome. I think we can do all those things. But the right interlocutor for policy is finance ministers. Environment ministers are, on the whole, lovely people. Not all of them, but on the whole they are. But the power is in the hands of the finance ministers. And it doesn't matter whether they're lovely or not. They have the power. And we have to be persuasive through the things that matter to them. The political economy, the risks, the, the public, the fiscal, and, the, and the so on. And we can. Um, the pension funds and the financial institutions increasingly they're doing better by insisting on high standards in the companies they invest in. Companies that are flaky on one dimension are probably also flaky on another dimension. And this dimension, particularly on, uh, on carbon, is going to become increasingly important. And uh, Mike Bloomberg is going to, Mike Bloomberg's committee working for the Financial Stability Board is going to come up with reporting protocols by the end of this year. And that could really be a game changer. In other words, companies have to report the riskiness of what they're doing, the physical risk, the litigation risk, but above all, the risk that people are serious about tariffs. So many companies are betting that we're not serious on tariffs. That has to be flushed out into the open because, well, it's very risky, not only for the world, which is most important in my view, but it's risky for their shareholders. Uh, and then if you make a massive bet against tariffs happening, and you stake your firm on that, that's a risky bet. And of course, we're working to make it as risky as we possibly can. So that, again, I think is going to be an important part of the story. Uh, I don't want to repeat what I said about the multilateral development banks, but I do think the combination of policy that's clear and stable and sound and sensible from the point of view of making markets work well, that will bring down the cost of capital. And the NDB's presence will bring down the cost of capital. And the skill is going to be able to put those two together on the kind of scale that we need. Anthony? Bob? I think the new governance model is all about creating the conditions for a race to the top. It is about creating positive pressure, positive competition. I like Nick's uh, no police from Mars and uh, judge justice from Jupiter. Um, it is absolutely true. I, I, I've been... Uh, asked by journalists over and over, so what is, who is the judge on the Paris Accord? You know, where is the, the authority going to lie to say who is doing what? I say, look, this isn't just about peer pressure. Well, peer pressure is a very powerful tool, but it's not the only tool. Peer pressure barked, backed by market pressure uh, is a lot more persuasive than any kind of a formal international mechanism that will tote people's uh, uh, performance and then try to punish them accordingly. Um, but how will that work? I, I think Nick just underscored a couple of the key constituencies where you see this race to the top. The unit of analysis of cities, um, the competition between cities for investment is fierce. It's within countries, and it's globally. And it's very interesting to see how that competition is playing out. It's not just an international beauty pageant. If you get 20 mayors in a room, they all call their city the most beautiful in the world, and I'm sure they are. If you live there, it's the most beautiful city in the world. But they are constantly competing for investment. 
Now, interestingly, if you go into any corporate boardroom these days, too, it's not just a beauty pageant anymore either because those institutional investors, the trillions, not billions, the pension fund managers that are trying to allocate huge chunks of capital, they are starting to actually pay attention to this equation. You can't make enough return if you leave your money where you've always had it you are going to have to get into new markets and start new kinds of investments. And that is going to change the equation. The question is, can it change fast enough? So creating the conditions for the race to the top is partly about structuring these competitions, structuring the competition among cities, structuring the competition among companies, structuring the competition among countries. And this is one of the dynamics that I am most pleased to see um, governments are now truly competing to see who can move faster. And it is not just for bragging rights. It's not just heads of state want to go to a meeting and say, see, you know, I'm, I'm better than you are. It is about putting themselves in a position to be able to attract investment uh, from various pools of investment. So I do think that creating conditions for a race to the top is that the essence of that governance equation that we're talking about. Um, one last observation I would make um, and have experts on both sides of me. When we talk about the finance equation, we're always thinking about where's the new finance coming from. Uh, I do think that we are in a, in a, on the cusp of a real shift on the subsidy equation. Um, it has been like pulling teeth to, to keep a, a subsidy uh, conversation on the global agenda. But each time it's had, it's a little more serious, it's a little more robust. And I do think that if we can find and directly apply better uses of those subsidy monies, so instead of just saying you need to save the climate, so lower your subsidies on hydrocarbons, you do need to see what you do with the, that money. The alternate uses of that money is the most powerful incentive for both political and market players. And there are countries that are doing really interesting experiments in this. I think the bank has been facilitating some structured analysis of those ex experiences. And I think getting that uh, out there uh, could accelerate this market. And I do think that if you look at some of those experiences, they stand the possibility of really speeding up this equation. Because when you start moving big subsidy numbers into new uses, and it pays off for you politically, socially, environmentally, uh, then you will do more. I think when you talk about speed, um, demonstration of fact is very important. And that's why the, the, this example is very important. And if we are talking about the city which can adopt a certain climate change policy that make them more attractive, and that then uh, creating, as, as, as everybody mentioned earlier, the competition to do the good or the right thing, that is very powerful. And that's why really using the convening power of the bank in which we are inviting mayor or even in this case the local government, and then they can see, oh, I can do that. I mean, I'm not going to underestimate this because we really have the real experience. Like, for example, doing business. Now in India, Prime Minister Modi, Gujarat is always top on it. And everybody else saying that I want to become at the top on the doing business. So they are now looking at, okay, what is the methodology, how to market it, how we are best to improve, which policy institution that need to be. I mean, this is exactly the same thing that if you want to talk about speed, when we see really the example, whether you start from the city management, renewable energy, you are talking about agriculture, that can be doable. Second, I think you're talking about speed, meaning that you really need to leverage. If you have a resource which is limited in each of the balance sheets, and uh, Nick mentioned earlier, the World Bank has a balance sheet. Of course, if you combine IBRD, IDA, IFC, and MIGA, we are end up with maybe around, what, 160 billion. But that, if you only using our own equity plus our own internal leverage, but if we attract other partners, including especially private sector, using the instrument that we can introduce, guarantee, so we don't even using the equity, but 
providing guarantee the country or a company can attract or crowd in. That can be much, much bigger. It can be one to five IDID to one to 20 to, 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 to uh, IFC, and it can multiply even 100. That is exactly what you call it speed, in which then when every dollar of resource limited, you can attract more to the instrument. And we are really now really innovating. The third is, of course, um, in many countries, the concessional financing, you talk about uh, the, the price in this case or not. And this is really the, the issue of many of developing countries. They feel that they are victim of all this climate change. And that's why they are entitled to have a financing which is below the market rate. And we are actually providing with this the financing at the concessional level. The idea that we are doing now, climate change is priority, and we are now in the process of mobilizing the IDA A team in which one of the five teams that we are going to implement for the IDA A team is actually on the climate change. And why it is important on this uh, concessional financing? First, that we are going to show using this money that all projects within the bank is going to be climate change screened, meaning that we are going to screen all the projects in terms of how much emission that they are and the social impact of this emission. Even up to the level that more upstream, that is our systematic country diagnostic, is not only what is affecting this country in terms of poverty reduction or share prosperity, but we also see how this country can be more sustainable. So in terms of the diagnostic, at the very upstream level, before the bank decides in which this country we will prioritize to support this country in this policy, whether policy on the fuel, whether on renewable, on the agriculture, transport, then we are actually using this systematic country diagnostic. The impact is actually beyond only the bank operation. We use the instrument and this diagnostic, we can combine with what we call it the P4R. One dollar, like the sanitation project that we are doing in India. We land for two billion, they use their own money for 24 billion, own budget. Not only in terms of the money that is matters a lot, but in terms of the government now own that this is very important and they need to measure the result in order for them to be able to deliver according to the, the goal that they have. So it's really in terms of what you call it institutionalizing and affecting at the very policy upstream level, using sometimes a limited resources, but you have the highest impact. Then you are going to have this, what you call it, the speed, the scale up, and the pricing which is right. Of course, uh, the bottom line again, we have to deal with the distortion. And that's why this carbon price is very important. If you only apply the carbon price, of course, the question about what level is right, but also it's on a limited, but if that limited city, for example, is going to be the city which is very powerful or very feasible globally, like Beijing, that will be really a big example. So we are not going to see like it's just not another city but the city which is suffering from the pollution and they are now applying this. That can be a very, very powerful of how we are, how we are going to create the, this the, the demonstration effect that then create a speed. So the bank really trying to use our resources, the, developing our instrument, convening, using the example, the knowledge, in order then to create more other policy makers to see that actually this kind of thing can be done, and it can be done this way. And actually, it can achieve results during your administration. Because sometimes politicians, I was finance minister, why should I do that? It is actually a long-term investment. It will maybe in the next two governments, which is I'm no longer actually there in my office, why should I do it? So if they see it that this is actually can serve that kind of interest, we actually try to use this narrow interest, but then for the greater public good uh, uh, result, I think that can be very powerful. Well, thank you very, very much. Uh, uh, I can, I'm, I'm sure there are going to be a zillion hands going up. I think uh, 
and we don't have a zillion minutes, so I'm going to be fairly, uh, uh, I'm going to use what I call ge a geographic dispersion method. I just want to make sure that way it's a randomized sample. I start with the gentleman right here. Thank you, everyone, for your remarks. My name is Timothy Chung from Clearview Energy Partners. My question is for Lord Stern. This weekend, the Financial Times quoted something you, you said or wrote, and uh, I don't remember exactly, but I think it was something to the effect that there's an alarming gap between the Paris pledges and what fossil companies are assuming. So I wanted to know if you could elaborate on that and why you think that is, and whether that's hopeful self-preservation or they just don't believe in the Paris process. And I think you touched on why that might be changing in your remark today. Uh, but if you could talk about why, what would happen if these companies to, truly do believe in the process and, and start to implement it. Thank you. We're going to collect a few questions. Uh, I see Francis, uh, uh, the mistress of forestry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you know what I'm going to ask about. Uh, so Kamal started us out by uh, talking about Lord Stern's report 10 years ago and how it really turned on a light bulb over the, the heads of economists. But the other thing that it did is put forests up there as a key part of any credible mitigation strategy. Ten years later, Red Plus, one of the most constructive negotiation streams, and yet main, mainly it remains an I a great idea that hasn't been tried. You know, really big finance hasn't been mobilized. So my question to the whole panel is, why not? What keeps us from understanding forests as infrastructure that we're destroying? It's not that we're not investing. We're, you know, the only safe natural carbon capture and storage technology that we have. Um, you know, what is it that keeps the World Bank's client governments from articulating, you know, forest protection as a credible, you know, investment opportunity and translating that domestically. Why isn't, you know, for, why aren't forests on the table as a worthy target of these subsidies that we're taking away from fossil fuels? So across the board, why aren't forests getting their fresh air? Okay. Um, I, I'll take, uh, yeah, the gentleman with the paper and then. Um, thank you very much for a, a great presentation. My name is Elliot Hurwitz. Uh, I was a uh, contractor to IPRD for 20 years. I worked in the international uh, evaluation group with Kyle Peters and uh, Ruben Landami, whom some of you may know. I was here uh, about a month ago, and I saw um, Homi Karas, whom you know, may know as well. Uh, and I asked you him, get to your question, sir. Yes. Yeah. I asked about the a Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. And I'd like anybody on the panel, please, to discuss the effects of the Chinese development program on an international um, environmental programs. Thank you very much. Um, I take the gentleman right in the back. Dan Camden from the University of California, Berkeley. I was delighted to hear the comments about carbon pricing. But I still fear that even with the discussion of acceleration, it's much slower than we would need. And I wonder about the mechanisms that have gotten some reasonable discussion in play, such as using government procurement, fee baits as a method to take some of those negative subsidies as starting grounds to give governments the chance to opt in, just like Lord Stern said in the beginning, about a way to do those things much more quickly than simply perhaps waiting for the Chinese market to launch, which is some of the narrative. And perhaps the 1.5 degree high ambition coalition provides a impetus to act early. I don't know how, what you would think about some of those methods to accelerate the process. Uh, yes, ma'am. I'm Mitzi Wertheim with the Naval Postgraduate School. Bob Rings at the CFR. Um, I started the energy conversation in Washington. I was asked in 2004 to start bringing people from the Defense Department together, and we created something called the Energy Conversation. And in fact, the Department of Defense was cited in the most recent issue of Scientific America about being such a leader in which they have been. My question for you is, how do you tell your stories so the general public who are not experts can understand it. It's incredibly complex. It's incredibly independent. We do not educate people to think that way. And I guess what I want to tell everybody is you need to go see this new film called Time to Choose, which just opened up last Friday at East Street and done by this brilliant uh, filmmaker who has his PhD in political science from MIT. 
uh, Charles Ferguson, it is the best story I've seen about forests, all of the climate issues related to the, to the energy problems as well. But I want to get back to saying, if you don't get the general public to understand it, and let me just give you one quick example. There was an article last week in the Washington Post about the way to deal with coal is to have the government to buy up all the coal companies in the country. So I just looked up, how many coal miners are there in West Virginia? 183,000. You're going to put 183,000 people out of work? And jobs hasn't been a part of your conversation at all. Um, I can assure you it's part of the thinking. <laughs> uh, I, I Let me stop there because I, am, I can see the clock. And I apologize that we took more time than we should have. But I did want to, you to have the opportunity to listen to these really excellent interventions. So I think we have a pretty diverse set of questions uh, on which to maybe round off the discussion. Uh, and I think it was a good balance between what I would call the, you know, the, the, the drivers of why we are interested, but also the politics and the political economy challenges. So I'm going to go in reverse order. Uh, I'll start with you, Shubhalyani, and uh, end this way. Well, uh, I think on the forestry, uh, within the banks, we are going to do for this uh, 50 countries, uh, with 10 countries in which we are going to do the large scale, multi-sectoral, that really, in this case, that we are going to present uh, the case and also really try to look at the, the climate change fund or forestry fund that can be effectively used. So we really like to want to focus in what is implementable <coughs> in the forest area, uh, taking into advantage uh, of the red plus before with all the strengths and weaknesses. Um, on the AIIB and uh, we. Of course, the AIB work with their own safeguard policy in this case. The, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Okay. Uh, so the AIIB is the new investment infrastructure bank created by China, in which I think now is more than 50 countries uh, as a member. United States and Japan, I guess, uh, in this case. Um, um, they have their own safeguard policy, but we are working with them. Uh, the need for the infrastructure is huge. So the question for us is, of course, how we are going to partner by creating a better influence in terms of the standard for them. So we are signing the MOU in terms of how we are going to co-finance it could be co-financing, it could be parallel financing, and then, then the question about what kind of procurement and safeguard in which then for the bank using our standard which on the environmental side and social, which I'm sure you are familiar with working with the bank, is going to be adopted. So that, that kind of thing is going to be the way that we think the constructive cooperation will create much more a better standard rather than lowering standard. Um, I think the question about the carbon price, well, we, I'll leave it to Nick in this case. Definitely, and really adopting with the level as well as that this is workable and creating more for the private sector to see for them to not, in, not only seeing as a price, but internalizing within their investment is going to be very critical. And that's why, I mean, in the past, maybe they look at the carbon price and whether they are credible enough, predictable, and that's why they have the ability to change the decision at the micro corporate level up to the public level. I think it's going to be very important. Um, I'm not sure, but uh, I think the first question is for me. The last question is about how you explain to the public I think general public now with the climate change, anything happening with the weather, they always link it to the climate change. What is happening flood in Paris, the hurricane, the thunderstorm. The, so there are so many that now general public is always immediately linked. So you have actually, in terms of 
more common understanding of the public that the climate changes become the issue, whether they become the source or the, then create the the motivation to find the solution is going to be one of achievement already with all this the the the, the real now with so many uh, actually happening. Many, especially developing countries, which I think most for the World Bank client, they really see it's not really a choice. So for both the policymaker and the public, because they really suffer. When you talk about the the the, the drought now because of El Nino, we are talking about Ethiopia, which we've already built with the social protection up to 6 million that need to be scaled up to 11 to even 16 million in order for them to be able to withstand this season with this El Nino that affecting their harvest. They're really seeing it, they understand it, and they want to have it. Senegal, in which we built or we supported the government in building and developing a seed, sorghum seed, which actually can withstand less water in a drought with more crops, 1.5 ton more every year. That will be something that really for them, that you see the problem, you expect solution, and we have to deliver. That will create what we call it the public understanding that this is a challenge that we have to address, and that's why we really need to, 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 to take an action. I think price and market mechanism is going to be very powerful. I come from Indonesia. Jakarta is the most uh, traffic jam country now, or city in the world, I guess. And people now suffering from that. Not that they are understand about the climate change, but suddenly now they also see that they need to do the public transportation investment in order for them to reduce not only on the climate change, but also for their own good. So there are so many things that I, I think can be done in a more easier way to communicate to the public. But I agree with you that there are still a lot of things to be done from just linking what is the weather situation with what is the climate change and then what is policy action and the consequence of the lifestyle of the people. Let me take a quick run at three of the questions. First, the energy companies. Uh, most energy companies are now calling themselves energy companies, but their their origins are something different. They're oil companies or they're coal companies or they're a very specific source. We have to uh, watch very carefully the success of those companies uh, that came from one source of fuel and are diversifying. Uh, watch Saudi Aramco. The world's largest oil company is going to become the world's largest energy company. You know, not going to be smooth, not going to be easy, but it can be done. And if Western oil companies don't move as fast as Saudi Aramco, they will lose in the marketplace. So um, there are a whole range of approaches of the oil companies in particular to diversifying, to become real energy companies. Uh, but I think that, that we need to, to call it out, and that will help incentivize. Secondly, on forests, um, uh, why can't forests get their fair share? Uh, forests are like water. Hey, it's there, it's free, it's all ours. Um, obviously, we have to, in, in public goods problems, forests are one of the, the toughest in terms of our global commons. Um, I think the answer is in part what we've started but need to accelerate dramatically is to make this not just a public-private equation, but it has to be a government, a corporate, investor, uh, activist equation. We need all of those constituencies lining up around the land use agenda. And when we started with treating forests as a forestry issue only and not as a consumer goods issue, we lost, left a lot of people on the sidelines. We didn't have to. So in 2014, when we started getting the private sector conversation of the Consumer Goods Forum together with the public conversation about Red Plus, we started to see some very different things happen. We need to get this all the way down to the consumer, um, and I think that's where you'll see things move. Lastly, on Mitzi's question about the general public and messaging, Mitzi, you're absolutely correct. One reason we were successful in Paris is that there has been a, an upswell of global public attention and, more importantly, local public attention 
to climate change and linking it to various phenomena people see around them. I would simply say um, the marketplace for information just doesn't happen uh, on its own. Uh, we do need to facilitate that information flow, and I will tell you social media gives you a platform, but you have to orchestrate. In 2014, at the Climate Summit, we spent almost a year ahead of time networking with different organizations about what was coming, what would happen. The result was over 3 billion, billion with a B impressions, about the Climate Summit, over half of the unique Twitter users in the world, many of whom are in Indonesia, the world's highest per capita <laughs> Twitter users in the world. Half of the world's Twitter users were talking about climate change during that summit. That didn't just happen. It's not because it was a cool issue that day. It's because there had been a year of preparation. So we need to think in strategic terms about how to network these communities to sustain that kind of a conversation. And you can go viral, and you can go global, and you can sustain a global conversation if you do that kind of preparatory work. And that's what we need to do. Um, so the first question was to me. Um, the, the report in the FT was prompted by a letter that I wrote to the FT, which built on the submission that a colleague, um, Dimitri Vengelis, and I uh, gave to the Bloomberg um, a commission or committee looking at protocols for financial reporting. And that, I think, as I said in my earlier remarks, will be, uh, could, could be a real game changer when people have to reveal the climate risks that they're taking. Now, a big part of that was um, betting against a serious policy. If you like, if you want to summarize everything in a carbon price, of course, it's more complicated than that. They're equivalent. <laughs> betting against a serious carbon price and betting the firm against a serious carbon price. So what we were arguing for is if that's what they're doing, it should be transparent. And it was prompted by a motion which the Church of England and, and others um, brought uh, at ExxonMobil uh, meeting, um, asking ExxonMobil to stress test their future planning against uh, Paris implementation. And uh, they got, I think, I've forgotten the number now, 37% of the shareholders uh, came in and uh, said they want that, which actually was quite a big big group, obviously not enough to pass the, uh, pass the motion. So what you've got is a number of uh, fossil fuel firms thinking ahead and changing, and some dragging their feet. In this case, it was ExxonMobil that was the example um, that we highlighted. And uh, before Paris, you've got six of the uh, European oil companies uh, asking explicitly for strong carbon price. Saudi Aramco is a very important example. So you're seeing change there, which is uh, really quite uh, striking. Um, but you also see resistance because they bet their, built up a strategy, built their assets in a world without strong climate policy. Now they have to adjust to a world with. Some will deny and oppose for as long as they possibly can. Fortunately, that's changing. Um, so that, that's what prompted that, that particular thing. On forests, um, uh, some things have, have been said, but I think the business story is very important. I mean, so, you know, the, 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 the coalitions that Unilever and other big firms have been part of, I think, are changing the sourcing, for example, of palm oil and other things. And they're doing it because they believe it's the right thing to do, and they believe that increasingly their consumers will demand it of them. So one way of changing is through the behavior of firms um, motivated partly by good reasons and partly by pressure reasons. There's also a good reason, but pressure from, uh, pressure from outside. I think the whole development story, as um, Bob mentioned, is extremely important on uh, forests. A lot of this is about improving agricultural productivity outside the forest so you don't have to dive into the forest to, uh, to make a living and, of course, also organizing forest ownership in a way that the use and corrupt of the forest is more easily available to the people who live uh, in them or, or close by. Um, there's one last thing I would make is that one thing that Paris really highlighted in a way that hadn't been before is zero net emissions. And the language of Paris, the good language, was the balancing of sources and things. And it's extremely important. Were we mad enough to stabilize at four degrees, God forbid, with you know, 
it would be dead already, but the, it would still have to be zero net because all the while it's zero positive, the concentrations go up, so the temperature increases because it's the concentrations. That, so zero net means stable concentration. So whatever temperature you stabilize at, you've got to have zero net. Now, zero net for two degrees is really 2070, 2080. Zero net for 1.5 degrees is probably 2050. Plus or minus five, 10 years. But that's the kind of ballpark that you're aiming for. And if we want to go zero net, we better be thinking about this thing. And uh, so I think that that language is going to change the game uh, as well. Uh, carbon pricing, is it going to work fast enough? No. So I think um, we mustn't leave off the chase, but there are some things like uh, regulation, procurement, uh, getting rid of coal. I'll come back to your question on that. Uh, pollution, of course, is a very big part of the story and has changed the game in China already, beginning to change the game in India and other places. And remember, 13 of the most 25 most polluted cities are in India, and none of that 25 are in China. And uh, that is surely beginning, uh, beginning to uh, change. The gentleman who asked the question about the AP Infrastructure Investment Bank has left. Homie was standing by the door. He mentioned Homie Carrots. He may be talking to Homie Carrots uh, <laughs> outside there uh, <laughs> somewhere. Um, but basically, the New Development Bank, which is the BRICS Bank, and the Asian Investment, Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, prompted by similar motivation, countries uh, outside the rich countries wanting to take uh, their own initiative, wanting to move forward quickly, wanting to chart their own path, and not and seeing that the existing institutions for them were not moving fast enough in terms of uh, scale and not fast enough in terms of governance. And so that was a motivation for setting up those institutions. The uh, New Development Bank, the BRICS Bank, where Amar and I and Dirk Divitz were very involved right from the beginning, made its first, announced its first loans in April this year. Uh, the BRICS, all the BRICS countries, five of them, and all five loans were on renewable energy. I don't think it's a matter of getting after these places, these new banks, to make sure they behave themselves. They're on a good path, and we should partner and celebrate and share. And I'm not always proud to be British, and I may not be very proud to be British on June the 21st, <laughs> but <laughs> who knows? Um, but we did get after that quickly, and it was important. And of course, we're directly involved as the UK, I mean, not me, I'm a, in a university, but directly involved in the UK in that, uh, in that story. So I welcome absolutely these new banks. I don't see them as uh, potential criminals who need correction. I see them as very good innovations who are thinking about the right uh, thing. Um, Mitzi Wertheimer, on, on the story of um, uh, the story, and that is fundamental. There are great storytellers. Uh, Charles Ferguson is one of them. I did actually give an interview, quite a long interview to him for that film, which is probably on the cutting, probably on the cutting room floor. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, but, but never mind, I'm sure it's, I haven't seen the movie uh, yet. There are other people like Yann Arthur Stefan, who's a great uh, French communicator on these issues at, in, in movies. I think the schools are absolutely fundamental. Some part of me thinks the future of the world lies in the hands of the geography teachers uh, at school. They do. They do, but the, the students that keep coming into our universities that we see are actually pretty good on uh, this stuff. I'm not saying it's easy, uh, and there are some people who are wonderful at it. But you've got to remember the problem. We're at one degree centigrade. It's the problem I raised right at the beginning. This is human beings anticipating. It's not human beings seeing uh, all the blood on the carpet. They're seeing blood on the carpet, but they've got to see that. You know, the words of Ronnie Reagan, you ain't seen nothing yet. This is one degree C. We're talking about risks for three and four degrees C. Three degrees C, we haven't been at three million years. Sea levels are about 20 meters higher than now. We're, you're trying to get people to imagine something way outside the experience of Homo sapiens and uh, where they can see at the moment the rather nasty things at one degree C. So that communication problem is a problem of using the human brain to anticipate. And so we have to have 
the right kind of imagery, the right kind of uh, storyline. Yeah, the um, China has, in its 13th five-year plan, has allocated large sums of the plan finances to uh, dealing with people. Dis not dealing is the wrong word. Helping, dealing with the problem of dislocation, helping people to into other kinds of uh, activities or where that's impossible through some kind of social support. Um, UK has lost its shipbuilding industry. You have to deal with those problems by helping the people who uh, are involved. And of course, there are many more hundreds of thousands involved in renewable energy in the United States than there are in the coal mines. But of course, they're different people. You can't necessarily just switch one person to another. So that process of transition is very important. It involves resources. It involves, uh, uh, it involves sort of arm in arm friendship and, and support. And that should be a part of the uh, part of the uh, process. I probably should probably stop there. Thank you, Nick. Um, we have gone beyond our time, and I sincerely apologize to those that whose questions we couldn't accommodate. The good news is this conversation will remain, uh, will continue. And I think, as uh, Bob said, I mean, the, the question is, how do you keep pressure on real action? And how do you find the right kind of circles in which to, to make it? But uh, this, this kind of discussion is very important, and we at, uh, at Bookings are fortunate that we have actually a very good internal team of people working on these issues. But we're also more fortunate that we can collaborate with a lot of colleagues outside Brookings and the multilateral institutions uh, as well. So with that, I would like you to ask you to join me in thanking the wonderful panel that we have.